let's start with the most devastating uh part of your the 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 first episode that the um title card from rambo 3 that i've long believed says that the movie was dedicated to the brave mujahideen fighters is a misnomer is that the case unfortunately yes it is that was that was the bombshell that we we discovered early on which set the tone for the rest of the the season uh it, it is someone just did a really aces job in photoshop uh and it went viral i don't know how many years ago but yeah there's no home video or you know like copy that has ever that has ever had that postscript so but as, as a friend of ours said um you don't need that movie to have a postscript that says this film is dedicated to the brave <laughs> it it makes that very clear throughout the entire film as as did many um hollywood products at at the time which is a, a kind of a, an aspect of the season that we go into a bit right and i mean i think that's why ring so true right the sentiment is because there are you know many people have a general understanding that the u.s funded the mujahideen in in the um in the past and they may have even heard the term operation cyclone before so um noah i'll ask you uh, an overview what was that what happened during that period of history that you know the cia and and the united states was pouring money into um these groups in afghanistan and how did it start sure so in the 1970s uh we began supporting and putting resources behind the people who would become in the future the mujahideen and in the late 1970s uh within afghanistan not anything really that the soviet union was doing uh, a a communist party uh, in response to uh, you know sort of an, an ailing uh, like you know despot who had been kind of like a developmentalist leader uh, they take over and there's a great amount of intrigue uh, to put it mildly but I do think that the you know the sort of central point is that the U S was involved and we had an interest there before but once the Afghan Communist Party took over it was very unstable and. The Soviets, I'll let Brendan explain the nuances of what comes next there, because I think it perhaps matters a little bit more. But, you know, well before we even get into sort of ramping up the aid, but we had sort of viewed Afghanistan in the 1970s as a potential Cold War battleground after it had been kind of in the in the background uh, for the decades past. It hadn't mattered that much. But then Communist Party takes over and, you know, all sorts of opportunities present themselves in the chaotic year of 1979. Yeah, I, I would say that um, we t we tend to make it a point of our show that the the funding and the relationship between uh, some pretty bad bad customers inside of Afghanistan begun or ha had begun before the Communist Party there got to power and before the Soviet invasion many years before, uh, but it started to grow and grow as it became clear that it was more useful by the by the day, and so big new. Brzezinski, who was the national security advisor to Carter, was really the most um, sort of active organizer of a jihad against the Soviet Union. And by the time Reagan was in power, <clears throat> all the things were in place to just have this thing become which, uh, what it became, which is the largest covert operation in CIA history. And some of our clients there were some of the highest paid CIA assets in, in history, and they were the types of guys who long before Al Qaeda was on anyone's lips were were known for throwing acid in the face of women and known for killing school teachers, be they communist or otherwise, um, known for essentially what we now think of and what that Rambo three um, uh, spiritual truth is about, which <laughs> is that they, they were the contras of of um, Central Asia, really. Um, and so the first half of our season is really watching that supply chain grow it's watching these guys get recruited it's seeing who was pulling the strings um in this project and of course looking at the soviets who um while it was true that they barreled into afghanistan knowing it was a mistake they did try to go to the un for peace negotiations from the get-go um which was quite unlike the us and vietnam a conflict this is always compared to and so we also try to look at you know there may be some uh, some lessons about what happens when a superpower um is bleeding another one and what happens when they try to stop peace negotiations from their desperate enemy or, or just stop them all together and tell their friends don't don't sue for peace keep this going because that's very much what was happening at this time as well so that's the first half of the season before we even get to the u.s occupation and, and right invasion. 
Well, uh, you mentioned Vietnam there, and I mean, either of you can take this, but but how did the U.S. failure in Vietnam play a role domestically, politically uh, in, in the United States is just pouring money, which a lot of that obviously was behind the scenes, but um, into these extremist religious kind of rural groups in um, in Afghanistan to combat the growing communist kind of uh, parties and and and, and discussions and, and organizations happening largely is my understanding in the, the more urban areas of Afghanistan. Yeah, so the you know the Vietnam comparison is one that the American government and and the people who carried out this operation uh, made themselves and and sort of, they viewed this as the kind of uh, uh, natural response, you know, like we had suffered a Vietnam, like, you know, the, this country that we we bombed into oblivion mm -hmm. uh, halfway across the world. We we are the victims there, of course. But um, and then after that war, there, you know, was for a lot of the people who had suffered it, there was the desire, uh, you know, to inflict something similar in the Soviet mm -hmm. Union. And that's not to say that that's the reason uh, all this happened or anything like that. Just that it's it's what you know when when you look at what these people are saying about why they're doing what they're doing, uh, it's something that weighs very heavily on them. And you know something that uh, has only sort of uh, occurred to me in like recent weeks is you know that John Milius, who wrote Red Dawn, which is spiritually about Afghanistan, like it's about what if we made the Americans the Mujahideen, and Milius is also the guy who wrote Apocalypse Now with you know France mm. uh, with, with Coppola. And I think that that sort of is a nice, like, you know, uh, representation of how these kinds of ideas are linked about, you know, we suffered this grievous, you know, had this disarming, disorienting experience for the American. And now we're going to go do with that to the Soviet Union. Consequences be damned for, for the country of Afghanistan, which will become, as a result of this, you know, a, perpe a perpetual a perpetual battleground for, you know, 40 to 50 years. And, and just one thing I... I think is important to note is how the two conflicts are very much not the same thing. I mean, obviously, in a in a in a basic sense, you have a superpower bogged down in a military quagmire that, you know, I can understand why people would call that a Vietnam for for the Soviet Union. But but on the other hand, um, as I've sort of started to to try and articulate when we when we explain the show or the season is uh, the Soviets and the Chinese did not invent Ho Chi Minh or the resistance to U.S. occupation in Vietnam. They were quite uh, on their way w without all that. Now, the Soviets and the Chinese did give uh, billions, probably not as much as the U.S. ended up giving in Afghanistan, but they did support those, those, those resistance fighters. But in the case of Afghanistan, um, the U.S. cobbled together the worst criminals uh, who happened to be the most brutal uh, commanders and tried to organize them into a coherent um, resistance front and it didn't really work because they were always trying to kill each other they were always fighting over turf they were fighting over drugs which was a huge source of funding for them yes and we can get to that but um and then of course the real proof in the pudding is after the soviets exit which they do uh, in quite an orderly way in in comparison that's a one big comparison to the u.s uh, uh project later on um they leave a government in place but it's it's beset by these disparate warlords and those are some of the bloodiest years of afghanistan is when these guys um knowing that they were never really friends or never a coherent national resistance movement they just start killing each other they start blowing up kabul which is one of the few places the capital of the country one of the few places that was untouched by the war and a very important place obviously in afghanistan as the capital and then out of them grows the Taliban and Al Qaeda and all this other stuff. That With did not US money. In I mean, just to yeah. hammer that point home, like this was, yes. a, uh, to, you can finish your sentence. Sorry, Brendan. No, no, absolutely. With U.S. money, with Toyota pickup trucks, we bought them with with, you know, yeah. all, all, all the trimmings. And um, and and we really didn't care and oppose the Taliban when they showed up either. We were uh, playing footsie with them about uh, pipeline deals, natural gas that could go through Afghanistan, which was always the, the, the hope after the Soviet Union fell. So anyway, it, it was a very um, it was a very different um, conflict in many important ways than Vietnam, but as you both pointed out, it was a great thing for Americans culturally, politically, to be able to say, now it's their turn to be the imperialist, and we can just spin all of this in reverse and project all of this Vietnam syndrome, so-called, that we've been having only a couple years before the Soviet invasion, and then just place it on Russia and 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 not, you know, 
examine any of the ways that not only are we not over Vietnam, we're now funding this war that we're claiming is is the worst uh, threat to peace. Since yeah, World War they're II. just as bad, and they're also incompetent in their battles. And 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 um, I mean that just is a the the, the fact that that was a, a consideration, even if it's somewhat subconscious, is is damning in and of itself. But you mentioned the pipeline element. Um, again, either of you could take this, but uh, outside of maybe it being you know, one, a proxy battle, obviously, between the United States and the USSR, um, and two, a potential ground for a pipeline to pass through. Like, what was the strategic importance of Afghanistan? Or what were the were there any was there any resource extraction? Because I think like, it's a little different than say, when we're having a conversation about Iraq, where that was yes. quite clear. <laughs> mm hmm. A good point of compare. So this is in part where drugs sort of figure in, because to your point, part of what, you know, natural resources may not be part of what uh, initiates a war, but they can absolutely play a role in sustaining it because they provide revenues to the bellig belligerents. And the role, you know, like the natural resource in Afghanistan, because as you point out in your question, or as you're sort of alluding to in your question, Emma, uh, there weren't really you know, many developed industries in the country. There was not a, you know, the, the existing agricultural uh, infrastructure in the country had been demolished by the war over the course of the war. So it meant that the only really remaining kind of uh, resource that was left to exploit and exploit it they did was opium, you know, which, you know, you know people can read about how, you know, poppies are easy to grow and very durable. And Afghanistan is right next to Pakistan. And another way to understand this conflict is, you know, then to think about, well, then hold on. If, if the only thing that they have is the drug money and stuff and that that arose as a consequence primarily of the wars, which is true, then, you know, what what is the value there? And that's hard for Americans to see naturally because we don't live there. But for the countries that are all like there, for instance, Russia and the Soviet Union, which are next door, mm. uh, what happens in Afghanistan is important in the way that you know what happens in Mexico or Canada is important to, is important to Americans, and for the case of Pakistan especially, I think their influence and their role here explains a lot as well. Because for example, the opium industry and the you know some of the basis for the rise of the Taliban, for instance, were uh, you know Pakistani shipping mafia or magnates, if you like, and there's a you know real i think kind of you know like those are the sorts of commercial relationships that are the really influential ones for example or i think in in determining uh the kinds of politics that you're talking about but it's so it, it has to be more submerged so i mean the the, the fact that that uh, like the heroin industry was a driving factor here like um i guess i i'm my question is how how can that be subtextual <laughs> when it seems so clear and then also there it's a black market drug obviously so like what is the direct benefit for capitalists in the united states uh well the the really amazing thing that tends to happen to make everything look a little too simple sometimes is that uh right as we sort of walked away from southeast asia as the center of the cold war in which we, the, the CIA, you know, this is a, a, a well-known um, phenomenon, a lot of um, great books on it. They created the Golden Triangle, you know, the heroin trade um, in Southeast Asia as a means of funding for all kinds of things, uh, not, not least the um, Cold War shenanigans that were always going on. And we simply took that model and brought it into Afghanistan, which, of course, had the poppies to... Um, to serve as another drug outpost that would provide illicit funds. And um, what capitalists got out of it in a sense was, I mean, there's always this political or geopolitical thing going on. And then there's a direct graft or, you know, um, economic uh, carrot and stick that, that, that wars of course represent. And it was just one of those more kind of sleazy um, underbelly aspects. Um, I, I obviously, you know, uh, no big American company was um, looking for the next heroin contract in the same way that Exxon was looking for the next, you know, uh, contract coming out of Baghdad. But loads of Western officials were paid off um, throughout the years with heroin money. Um, and and I would also I would put it like this as well that um, 
you know, in Afghanistan, we see the the, inter the intersection of both the war on terror, of course, and but also the war on drugs. And neither war, so-called, is really about abolishing terror, right. per se, or abolishing drugs, per se, be it over there or over here. Um, it's about market share. It's about getting rid of people who are not in our club who deal drugs and making space for the people who are in the club who deal drugs. And plenty of our clients, the warlords who came out of the Mujahideen, some of them ended up in the Taliban, some of them ended up on our side in the Karzai government, um, they were protected. Um, they were kingpins all over the government in Afghanistan that we thought uh, were good guys and deserved their share of the heroin trade and who were also terrorists and deserved their share of the terrorism racket as well. So so it, you're right. It is a much more it, it's not nearly as um, as sort of. Um, uh, surface surface level evil um, as as the oil as the war for oil or, or whatever that happened in Iraq, um, but Afghanistan was always kind of a means to an end for all for, for for the British and for the Americans. For the Soviets, it was a government over their border that they thought was cracking up and you know quite quite erroneously thought they could prop up. But um, you know the British and the Americans always used it as a as a means to control the spigot of of that region and as we saw they didn't stop at afghanistan in the bush administration they went right on to the next war and i think their plan after that was the real prize which would be iran which of course shares a border with afghanistan mm -hmm. and with appliant afghanistan and appliant iraq there would be the ability to do what the neocons always really dreamed of but things went so so um uh poorly that they didn't get to do it which was which was really control iran eventually